Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. It's time for our monthly session of questions and answers with all things relating to family history. We have some great questions already submitted, which you can do in advance. And I know I love it when some of you do that. It gives me a great chance to see what people are thinking. Although, don't let that stop you. This is your hour. If you have a question, if you have something else you want to add, something else you want to talk about, then get it in on the comments. Tell everyone else we've got an hour. You can share this now. You can invite other people. Anyone can come in. We'll get to as many questions as we can. We have a whole hour to talk about nothing but family history, all of those brick walls, all of those problems. I wonder what other words we have for brick walls. They've always seemed to be called brick walls, but I'm sure there are some other words. Roadblocks, maybe. But we are here to solve them. And if I don't know the answer, of which there are some things, maybe I don't, there are some wonderful people here in the comments that also might have some ideas. And that's one of the great things about the community that is Find My Past and everyone here at home working together to solve some mysteries. So it's a rather sunsetty kind of day in Edinburgh. It's cold, but it's fresh, crisp, some would say. And I can see people tuning in from St Albans, Massachusetts, Oxford, uh, Wexford, Southport. I see Louise Nedimer as well. Um, Ellie's in the comments today, so she'll be here helping us out as much as she can. Uh, South Wales, Stoke-on-Trent, Oregon, uh, Utah, uh, oh, so many people from all over the place. Ellie is here to keep an eye on me, but this isn't as uh, free-flowing as Friday, so you'll have to wait till Friday if you want uh, chaos to unfurl. This is a little more serious, so... Uh, uh, that's one. <laughs> if you can call that an advertisement for Friday, then there we go. But uh, you will see me again on Friday where we will be talking about this week's new releases and some other great stuff. Hi, Sean from New Zealand. Uh, hi, Eric from Warrington. Hi, Beverly from Manchester. Audrey from Chesham. Audrey's keeping an eye on me as well, so that's fine. But we're talking about all of those great questions, the burning issues that you might have relating to family history. So, uh, I see some people already saying they're doing some great uh, great discoveries. But let's dig in straight away to some of the questions that were submitted beforehand. So let's start with an interesting question from Andrew Davis. He asked about the place Telford, which if you use our 1939 registry map search, you can use that to get to Telford. However, Telford didn't exist in 1939. So I can see where this might be slightly jarring. But the clever thing about this with our 1939 map search is you can search with postcode, you can search with street, you can search with town, any kind of settlement. And this is specially designed in this way because it's a way in to get to records that you might not have realized. And that's maybe perhaps if you're a beginner to family history and you don't know where to look, or you don't know the original parishes, we try and keep things in a historic way. But in 1939, there were no postcodes. So being able to search by postcode to find your house, the place where you live, looking at the people who live in your property, that's something that is really useful and exciting for some people. You don't have to use it that way. You can just look for the places that you know of and the streets that you know of and things like that. But being able to go in both ways opens this to a whole new kind of researcher and a whole different kind of person. So it's, it's kind of a bit of a bit best of both worlds, and that's why we do it. If you're looking for records, you will find them in that old school way, but we'll also allow people to find things in that way. We geolocate our records, and that's one of the great things about Pharma Pass Search, because you have that wonderful slider, which is one of my favorite inventions, because it means that when our ancestors ignored little boundaries on a map, we don't have to care about them either, because we can say, my ancestors, I think, were born in Ipswich, and I think they're in there. But they may have come from five or 10 miles away. They might have been somewhere else. A lot of people came from, they moved around quite a lot, but they moved around a very small area, a relatively compressed area, usually around about 15 to 20 miles. So this means we can extend our search and look in neighboring parishes, look in places that's down to this geolocating of all of these locations, which means that we can use uh, not just a map, but we can just look at maybe the church across the road, which might be in a different parish according to the map boundary, but it's actually closer to get to than your actual parish church, which is right on the other side of the parish. So there are lots of different things that we can use this slider for. So that geolocating, in 1939, we can use it with things like postcodes and stuff to get to where we want. But in all our records, you can use this to expand the gap of where you're looking and keep moving and searching in different directions in different ways. That's why 
that is so useful and that's why we do it so there is method to the madness and you can use whichever way you feel most comfortable and that's the way we've got lots of people who might be looking for granddad or grandma and trying to get further back as well as those of us who might be more experienced who might have 200 300 400 500 years on our family tree and be looking for something a bit more detailed so we've got to kind of give a bit of everything for everyone and that's why we do something like that I see Rachel say, my grandfather served in the Second World War in both the RAF and the Fleet Air Arm. Where will I find his war records? Will there be public records yet? If it's after 1920, unfortunately, at the moment, they're still with the Ministry of Defence and you'll have to order them. Uh, you can do. Uh, it's a little bit of a longer wait at the moment because of coronavirus, but it's well worth doing. You'll get a massive collection of records. You need to be next of kin. So if you've got a parent that's still alive, they will be the next one to do it. Uh, or if it's if you're the next of kin, then you can do it. Uh, send over a little bit of details, a bit of information, and they will send you this back. Um, it costs, I think it's about 28, 29 pounds, I think. I can't remember exactly. I haven't done it for quite some time. But you will get everything in that service record, and it's well worth doing. You get lots and lots of information, but it's not a public record yet. It might be in the future, but right now, the only place to get it is the Ministry of Defence. So that's the place to ask, and they're the only people that have it. So, uh, yes, it might cost a bit of money, but it's well worth it it's worth doing it's one of those things where i always like to have something on the back burner i like to feel like i'm making progress in family history even if i'm doing nothing and i like to do nothing quite a lot so if i've ordered a record or i've ordered something then i can feel like i'm still progressing so i'll order something it might take five or six weeks to get that record to have it delivered uh, but i like to feel there's something still cooking so even when i'm not doing family history something's doing family history on my behalf. I like those wills that we can order. They're wonderful, aren't they? £1.50 for England and Welsh wills at the moment from 1858 all the way up to yesterday. We've got a massive collection of probate indexes on our website, and we can search them in much better ways than you can on the government website on Farm My Past. You can take those references and you can use them to order that will. And that will, £1.50, I ordered one just last week. It took about three days. I was a little bit... Uh, a little bit frustrated, really. I wanted to wait a little bit longer just so I could feel like something was still cooking. But it's easy to do, and it feels like something's going on, even when you're not doing things. So I really recommend that, and I recommend putting in for any of those service records if you are able to, if you're next of kin. And if you're next of kin, then that person must be very close to you, and so that makes it even more worthwhile to take a look. And uh, there are some very, very, very great details in there. You can get all kinds of things in those service records. As you may have seen the First World War service records, which are full of similar detail, Second World War, just as much, if not more. So very, very big, hundreds of pages at some times, often smaller, but very detailed and full of everything you might want to know about that particular person. See a few people here coming through. Um, Terry... Adams has just said, uh, I have my nan's birth certificate. I've been told she's brought up in a children's home. How can I find out? It would depend really on how old your grandmother is. So uh, I would assume that these records would still be private and that would make things a little more difficult. She might be able to look for her records. If it's a council children's home, then that would be uh, records held by the council. If it was a private one, perhaps Bernardo's or the NSPCC, something like that, then that would be separate in the period of the 1950s and 60s and things like that, there were lots of very small children homes. And so they were more independent and then overseen by the council. So those council records would probably be your best bet. And that would be the first place I would look. Your first place to go to, I would think, would be the local council and then see what they have and go from there. Uh, my own grandparents ran a children's home for a little while. So I know a little bit about that. But uh, yes, I think it's all council administered and the records will be there. But be prepared for the fact that they may still be private. And if your grandmother's no longer with us, then you might not be able to get hold of those records, at least for now, until maybe some privacy rules have expired in some time. I see Ivy is saying, there we go, uh, £30. So I was almost there uh, with the cost for those service records. And the wait is about a year. But again, it's still worth doing, even if you know you're waiting for it. It's going to come eventually. Uh, definitely going for it. And uh, so let's see we've got. So uh, we've got a few. Uh, Vicky has asked, are there maps on Find My Past? And if so, how far back? We have a good selection of maps, different kinds of maps, wonderful maps. There are some great resources for maps online that you can go elsewhere. But the Find My Past maps include a great selection of maps from Ireland. We've got some very early maps from Ireland, over 500 years old. They are fantastic. They're the sort of ones that have the, the dragons in the, the water and the ships shipwrecking off the coast and the wonderful hand-painted colors 
particular images. They show you where different uh, tribes and clans and things live and all kinds of great stuff. So they are really fascinating. But we also have more modern maps going up to the 1900s and, and beyond. Um, we do that for all of Britain. When we have our map search, you can see on the search, you can drop down, you can see, I think one is from the Victorian era, one is from the 1930s, another one is from the modern day. So you can see how things have changed over time. Really useful to move backwards and forwards through time and just see how things have evolved over that period, uh, especially when you're looking at perhaps a more rural village on the outskirts of somewhere like uh, Leeds. That's one place I looked at, Temple Newsom, And that little village is now just a suburb of Leeds. And you can see it just be absorbed over the decades. Really interesting to see that disappear. So that's really useful. And there's also really great thing for Irish research is Griffiths valuation maps. So those maps uh, that you have seen, if you go to Griffiths valuation maps, you can look for a certain town land, you can go to that. And if you look at the Griffiths valuation books, you'll see a little column on the left hand side. Now, I think this is your left. I'm not sure because everything's reversed and I'm never going to be left and right to begin with. But there's numbers and letters on that. And unless you're an expert, you'll probably have ignored that or not really done anything with it. But that number and letter refers to an area on that map on those Griffiths valuations maps and plans. So if you have Irish relatives and you found them on Griffiths valuation, which is a, a wonderful census substitute, really, really useful for Irish research. A little bit strange because if you've got, say, a tenement or something, they would only list the lead tenant and it's only the head of the household. But if you're perhaps in a more rural area or something like that, then it is really useful. And even in the, the, the bigger areas, you've still got chance. You can find not only where your ancestor lived, but you can see the outline of their property. You can then compare that. I saw a couple of ancestors from Ireland and they lived over the road from each other. And I thought, ah, OK, well, that's how they might have met. There's different things. In another case, there was the person I was looking for and there was the town market and they would go to market, I guess, and they would walk past the house of the person they later married. And you can possibly make the story using those maps. So there are lots of maps on Farmer Past and they're really interesting and expect more as well in the future. We love a good map here at Farmer Past. I know my colleague, Jen Baldwin, I know Ellie, I know all these people really like a good map, but there are some other resources too. National Library of Scotland is great. There are some great maps around. Uh, there are lots online and never forget Google Maps as well, which is great. I love that street view. I love going in and seeing where things are. There are some great uses for maps. Maps are great for family history, but don't forget, don't just look at the modern ones, look at the older ones, because that's going to give you some extra bit of understanding about the world around you. What have we got here? What else as I go through? Um, let's see, we have... Um, Heather has asked, something sounds good, what's the title? I'm not sure what that was to, so you might have to, um, uh, someone might have to help me out a bit. So, oh, I see, it's been answered. Apologies. Uh, what we've got here. So uh, Ellie's mentioned about these maps, wonderful different maps you can use to search. Matthew's made a comment about these service records. Several years ago, I decided to get my grandfather's army records. My uncle was his next of kin, gave his permission. So I got the forms I needed to complete, but I forgot to send them off. I still have the forms. Maybe I should wait until next year. I mean, there's no time like the present. The, the best time to do it was a year ago, but the second best time is today. So definitely it's worth doing. Uh, Audrey's made a good comment about Children's Homes. There's a Children's Homes website, childrenshomes.org.uk. Uh, Rosalind has a good question. Is it possible to get military medical records from World War One from the MOD? So those medical records, if they're not part of a service record, we've got some hospital records, they're on Find My Pass. We've been doing a great uh, collection on Find My Pass relating to these records themselves. However, not many of them survive. Only a sample was kept. The rest were destroyed. So what you're seeing, if you're lucky, is the record that you need but most of them no longer exist. So you're probably best off looking for people's medical histories in their service record and hope that one of those records is one of the ones that survived. Because we call, as many of you will know, those World War I service records and the burnt records because they were damaged in an incendiary bomb attack in World War II. And the ones that are left sometimes have water damage, sometimes have marks of burning, scorch marks, all of those things in there. So hopefully, fingers crossed, you'll do all right. But you're kind of in the lap of the gods. We've got to see what happens. But definitely take a look at the Find My Pass World War I uh, military medical collection because you have a good chance maybe of finding if they're there, they're going to be in that, although not so many of them survive. And then Sylvia said, does anyone not have a map? This is true. Absolutely everyone loves a map, I am sure. 
Uh, and some great things. Ellie is on fire today with all of the different links pulling through. She's doing really well with all of the different things coming through. So she's a great help. Uh, Sylvia said, my father ordered his RAF service records and medals in the late 1980s. It was free for him. If he, yes, if you're ordering your own service record, it is free. So that's one thing. If that person that you're looking for is still with us, then definitely get them to help you. Um, uh, I now have the service records. My daughter's keeping the medals safe for my grandson. Well, that's very noble. That's quite exciting, isn't it? That's good. I get my lighting right. I'm not doing very well. Um, I look very orange. But uh, that's a wonderful, noble thing. Uh, Ivy's saying as well, you need to apply by post. The link for the forms added by Ellie, higher up in the messages. It's great. Um, and uh, Matthew said, you need written consent for next of kin for military records. My uncle never wrote anything and has now died. I believe it relates to the year they may have died. I think if you can prove they've died after a certain amount of time, I think it's all right. And I think that's 25 years ago. And uh, so that would be the thing. So uh, you, there's a big guide in the link from the Ministry of Defence when you go to order that describes exactly what the criteria are, what you need to do, and it's really detailed and really thorough. If you follow those guides, you shouldn't have much of a problem in getting hold of those records. So uh, definitely uh, you need to just follow those rules and you should be fine. Uh, so we see uh, Jean and said, my grandmother's brought up in the Leicestershire cottage homes. Is there any way to get records of her time there? If they are, um, it depends what kind of homes they are. If, the, if we're looking for, I don't know enough about what they are. If they're children's homes or something like that, I think all the things we've talked about before will still apply. So definitely said, talk to your local council first of all, and then move from there and see what goes on. If they're not, if they're perhaps uh, arms houses or something like that, so I'm not too familiar with that part of the world, then the local archive will be the place to look and see what they have because they might have details too. Outside of that, if they're in a census year, 1911, 1901, or we call 1939 register surrogate census, then you can search by address and you can perhaps find their record in those places if you know the address of this location so that will be worth doing as well so there we go so those are the different ways to get in and those will be the the, the ways i would recommend and hopefully that will get you there and um, sally's asked what kind of anzac records does farmer past hold we have a fair amount we've got a, a great collection of memorial records we've got a number of different embarkation lists and roles we've got some records of those who fell in different records from the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. There are lots and lots of different records that all come together to merge. We've actually made a, a merged pot we made last year of memorial roles and inscriptions for Australia, which was really quite popular. We added some more records in. Uh, that's the first place I'd go for anyone that fell in the First World War uh, for uh, any Anzac record. And then there's also lots of surrogate different records as well. If you use our all record sets, then you can get to those records really, really easily. Um, filter by Australia, filter by New Zealand, and start looking through what we have. And we have some great collections there, medal rolls, uh, embarkation, list, everything you can think of and more on the way so definitely uh, doing all right for that and uh, i know that there's anzac day coming and so definitely keep your eyes peeled for maybe more records around that particular time although i know they also uh, commemorate remembrance day which uh, in the same vein, if you've got more Remembrance Day questions and more things to talk about relating to Remembrance Day, don't forget tomorrow there's a Remembrance Day panel with some really, really fascinating experts that are going to come in and, and give Alex a run for his money with all of the facts and all the knowledge that you could imagine relating to this. So uh, I am I know a, a little bit and I'm, I'm sort of OK with this sort of stuff, but they are going to be the last word. If you have any questions about wartime, military records, anything like that, they are going to be able to answer your question in seconds. So don't forget to tune into that. That's at four o'clock or whatever time you are, uh, wherever you are in the world, then it's the time that this started and that's tomorrow. So that will be really worth tuning in for. I'm definitely going to try and make sure I'm there as well. Really exciting. And see, we've got Karen has asked, if you have a match in hints with someone's tree, can you view that tree? No, at the moment you can see that hint, you can see that match, but not the whole tree, which keeps things nice and private. There are other uh, experiments, maybe you know, exploring different things, but at the moment this means it's much nicer to be able to just look at one person and that means that you're not worrying about other people just copying your whole tree wholesale or something like that. It means that it's a lot more condensed. It means people can be a bit more confident that people aren't just copying your tree down because everyone's got that one person who they let in and then they copy uh, all of those records and you find them all over as well. So that's one thing. And when we talk about um, military records as well, before I forget, there's a great 
thing that we're doing uh, from tomorrow at 10 o'clock UK time. We're going to offer our military records for free uh, and for the duration of remembrance and that will end on the 15th so if you have any military records that you want to look at and you're not a subscriber yet then of course i'm sure you will be eventually because there's so many great records and so many great records coming as well but take a look explore what pharma past has and maybe that might be able to give you the incentive to come and join us and see what wonderful records we have so we have a great military records collection and that will be free from tomorrow for a few days in honor of remembrance all of those men who uh, and women who served in all wars of uh, the 20th century and beyond and also uh, not just for those who fell but those who came back as well so really really interesting stuff there uh, what have you got here um Oh, Danny's got a good question. I've got a great grandfather that was a foundling, an unknown orphanage in Swansea in 1858. Any way to find a record? Hmm, well, that is a tough one. I would start with the 1861 census, see where they are and what they're doing at that point. If you get them there and you're convinced and you're solid with that being their name and that being everything else, then move back a little bit and keep going. If they're a foundling, it kind of depends on what might be detailed about them. If they're an unknown orphanage, perhaps start with newspapers, see if the name is kept, see if there's some details about someone being left, because that may happen. You may find some detail in newspapers. Uh, also look at birth records, civil birth records and parish baptisms. You might still find someone of that name being baptized and they might detail in that they're a foundling. You might find them in the civil records as well. And then if you can order a civil registry, it might tell you a bit more. But if they're a foundling, usually the, the whole point of that was secrecy. You have these tokens that were given and the tokens were very, very specific so that that mother could come back and claim that child later on if they knew what the token was or sometimes had the other half of a token or something in the same way. So they may not have the name they were born with. They may have a different one. And then you might have to look at DNA and things like that to try and give that person some identity. But if you're looking at DNA, you're in the right sort of time period. So you would be able to use DNA. You would use some triangulation and maybe get some answers. But those are the things I would do, first of all, to have a look to see if I could find something. It sounds like it's a bit of a desperate struggle and a bit of a challenge, but that's when family history comes to life. So don't give up. There might still be some interesting stuff in there and there might still be hope. So keep looking. I'm seeing uh, everyone talking about the service records that you can order. That's great and saying you have to apply by post, not online. I see Audrey and Ivy just reminding people of that. The forms are online, but then you've got to go and you've got to print them off and you've got to send them in. So uh, thank you, Ivy, and thank you, Audrey, for helping out with uh, helping people getting those service records or starting to apply. Tony's asking, I've hunted for passengers to America about 1823-ish, but can't find them coming here. I suspect they've left from Hull. So... 1890 is the year in Britain where the Board of Trade says we need a second copy of all of these passenger lists. From 1890, we can be pretty comprehensive in the terms of knowing what we have uh, and what passenger lists exist for going anywhere really abroad. Before then, uh, there was no obligation to keep these records. So the problem is some people kept them not everyone. We do have a collection of records, early passenger lists, and they're listed in an interesting way. They're called, I'm trying to remember, they're in our uh, all record sets. I think they're called early immigration um, uh, records, early immigration uh, to the United States or something like that. I can't remember what it's called. I, I will dig it out and I will reply to you. But those uh, passenger lists are some of the only ones that survive and there are a handful there are smattering but it's much harder to find records of people leaving britain at this time where i would be looking is people arriving because people are much more interested in arrivals than leaving and you will find early passenger lists in the united states at this kind of point though they do survive and they do exist so i would be looking at those places and don't just look at new york look at boston look at Galveston, look at all of these other ports uh, that you might use, um, Philadelphia, all of these things that you could find maybe someone uh, arriving at, and maybe even in um, Canada as well, there are lots of people arriving in New Brunswick and traveling down, there's other ways people arrived, but all of these ports may be worth a look. 
So broaden your search and you'll find out a little bit more. Uh, hopefully in a later census, maybe in the United States, you'll find out if that's the person you're looking for and they might give you an arrival year, uh, depending on how old they are, which censuses you'll find them in. So that's definitely something to pursue. I would uh, just really, really hope that that helps you a little bit. Uh, reminder there from Ellie, the free access to military records starts at 10 o'clock UK time tomorrow and ends at 10 o'clock UK time on Monday. So that's when you can take a look. And there's a link there to take a look at what records are there. So that would be really useful. And uh, oh, uh, Andrew's made a good point. If you're applying for service records, do you get your checkbook from the back of the drawer? I don't even think I have a checkbook at the moment. That's the one. So that's uh, that's a, a one to take a look for. Um, and uh, see, there we go. So Ellie's found it. Early immigration to the United States. It'll be early immigration from Britain because it also covers Canada as well and things. But it seems uh, it just cuts off a little bit early, unfortunately, 1815. So that's what I was going for. But I think if you're talking about 1823-ish, it might be a little bit too early for you. But still have a look. Maybe they came a little earlier. If not, it gets a bit harder, and I would definitely be looking at arrivals only. So that's what we'd be going for. So what else have we got here? We've got some more questions. Um, lots and lots. There we go. Uh, Andrew made a good point. Canada is a good shout because it's a British colony then. It was. Uh, there were lots of people traveling from Britain to Canada, uh, and uh, it was a lot easier to travel that way. And uh, so the ships would also, they would travel to Canada and then they would move further down the coast. They would travel along the coast. So some people just got off earlier. I know of some cases of those people who were traveling thought to America. Uh, and I won't point to any of my own relatives. And I won't say if it is one of my own relatives because you'll look on me in a very different way. But I know of certain uh, Sicilians that got onto boats and decided that they were going to go and live in a new life in America and got off in Liverpool thinking that they were in America. And it took them long enough to find out because no one else spoke, uh, they didn't speak any English, that they had made a new life in Britain before that they'd uh, realized they weren't in America. So there are a few cases of that. And in some cases, some unscrupulous people who thought, well, let's give them a cheaper ticket and they can get off and they won't realize. I've heard of some stories of people getting to Glasgow and thinking they're in America, which they do have a nice grid street system. Maybe you could think it's New York if you're uh, sort of squinting a little bit i'm not sure but there are definitely cases of that kind of thing happening so um definitely some people may have got off in canada early and maybe migrated over time so you'll find that a number of times families going through and then sometimes you'll also just find the same ship going down the way and uh, beverly's last question is there any way to delete a full family if there's a mistake instead of having to go one by one you can delete a whole family tree beverly but i imagine you don't want to do that i imagine you want to just do each person I find it easier and better to do one by one unless it's so big you should just delete the whole tree because if you go one by one you can be certain that you're getting rid of the right person and also there are two different ways to delete people you can remove them from a family or you can remove them from the tree and you want to make sure you're doing the right one because otherwise you'll end up with these floating people that are just uh, attached to nobody and then you'll find them later on and they, they're very very frustrating when you're doing some calculations or working out and you have this one person just floating about and when you disconnect them you have to try and get get hold of them again that gets very difficult so yeah i'd go methodically one by one taking from the edges all the people that aren't useful and uh, go from there i see Linda saying it's taking at least six months um there was a comment earlier on from ivy that it's taken about a year linda to get those service records so i mean you can understand that these people are probably in an office or an archive there's probably some social distancing they've got to do this all in paper it's going to be a little difficult for a little bit more long time to come uh, but it's worth putting the request in and then at least you're in the queue at least you're waiting for it to happen so definitely worth doing Although, yeah, it might take a little bit of time. So we've, we've got to uh, have a bit of faith and just hope they'll get there eventually and they will get there. But, um, of course, they're living through the same difficult times we are. So that makes things a little interesting. What other questions do we have? We've got some more things there. Um, Richard said they have a similar problem with an unknown father. They have a high DNA link with a second or third cousin with a missing grandfather. Neither of you can find any common link. That now gets to the point of triangulating your results. So you need to start looking at the people you have in common. So the people that you share with this second or third cousin, mark them all off and say, well, these are from some common ancestor. And do the same thing with other matches you have until you get these little groups. They call it clustering. And then you can then start to try and maybe do a little bit of their family tree to work out where they connect. And you'll end up with a few little chunks of a family tree. And then hopefully you'll be able to knit them together 
with a little bit more information, a little bit more evidence. Sometimes you have to wait for another person to test and you'll never know when it might come. There was uh, a, a, some work that I was doing for a relative of mine recently and one new person had tested and that just blew the whole thing open instantly. Everything was solved because they had just the right amount of DNA, just the right length, depth of relationship. That meant that we could just go, there we go. That's where it all fits in. All fit together instantly. Perfect. So sometimes you've got to be patient a little bit, but it, it is if you start with that process and get yourself ready, as soon as that person's test results come in and they appear in the big pool of matches you've got, that's when they can help you out. So definitely uh, prep yourself and then get ready. Uh, I see uh, Tony saying that they have found it safer to disconnect one person connected to the family line, disconnect them from my genealogical tree. They're still there, but not connected to me. I can work on deleting them. That's true. If you think they might be more useful in future, then, yeah, you can disconnect them and keep them. That's also one tip that you can do. Uh, there's a lot of small towns with people with the same name, particularly if it's a rarer name, you think maybe a few generations back this will attach again. So that's a good thing you could do. Just detach them from the family and keep them somewhere and then you can go back to them and use them uh, what else have we got here um a few other comments i'm going to take a look at some of the early questions as well the ones that we'll put in in advance i know you're going through you still got time to submit questions in advance too but let's see so uh, hillary said is there a way to report missing pages in the census yes email our customer support team um, there are some known gaps in censuses that's part of the problem some were lost and that's unfortunate some have been uh, destroyed over time. Uh, one thing uh, that really frustrates me is that Fife in 1841, there's a big gap because the records that were being sent to Edinburgh on a boat, the boat sank and they lost that big chunk of Fife. So parts of it, Fife has no 1841 census. A particular part of uh, Flintshire, Denbyshire that I need for um, my family history research, there's no 1841 census, but there's a big list of missing pages, known missing pages and missing parts in our censuses. If you go to the all record sets, you can go and you can take a look and it's on the right hand side, on that right hand side, which I think this is the right, um, again not sure i hope so um then uh, we can then show you this list of interesting things that you might need they might be similar record sets they might be tips guides anything you can think of and on the right hand side we have a thing of list of known missing parts of the census i think it's also below the search as well and take a look there if you can't find someone then see if that area is known to be missing if it's known to be missing if it's lost because of history we're kind of a little bit stuck but if it's not, then definitely get in touch. One thing I would do as well is search for people from that town. Farmer Pass is a great thing where you can search with any part of information. So search for that location and see how many entries come back. If you can't find your relative and you think, hmm, something's not right, they should be there, look for that town and see how many results come back. If you get 10,000 results, you know the town's there. Something's looking okay. So what's gone on? Are they mistranscribed? Is that page lost? Let's find out. Also, take the address from a later census and go backwards. Search for that address. Search for that street in the census that you're looking for. And maybe that also, if you can find that street, you can work back and forwards. Some of these censuses come from microfilm and they can be of a riotously poor quality. And they take an incredible amount of skill to read. So we've done pretty well, but there are going to be some things where you'll look at it and you go, ah, yeah, I see what they did. And that, that's one of the things when I found things mistranscribed in some earlier censuses, I look at it and I can totally understand why. Some of the pages have just been disappeared. One uh, book that I was looking at, the only bit of the census that survived was my family. The rest of it had been burnt and ripped and scorched. And I thought, well, that was lucky. I mean, for every time I'm lucky, I'm definitely unlucky in many other ways. But that was a, a stroke of luck. And the people who have ancestors who are on the rest of that page, you're kind of a bit stuck. So it's it's worth doing that. It's worth going in the different ways and seeing what you can get if you're missing a census entry. So see, so we've got and, uh, Andrew saying, Q, you have a spreadsheet with known census gaps? I believe that is what we've got as well. I think that's on the Pharma Pass pages for the census. So that will be the same thing. And that is said really worth looking at or at least getting yourself familiar with because once you know, because you know the areas you're researching, you'll know if you're uh, barking up the wrong tree, the wrong family tree, no less, when we're looking for censuses. That's really, really important. And uh, so we see uh, we've got some more questions here. We've got some. Um, 
Right. Uh, Jane Spencer is trying to trace her godmother, who was a nun. She knows her name before she was a nun. Her name is a sister and the name of the convent she was at when she last heard from her in the early 1970s. The convent community closed in 1992. I think she's probably died, but I don't know how to trace her online. I don't know her date of birth either. So the first place I would look at would be the diocese that would be involved, the Catholic diocese, because these records are Catholic Church records, and they're owned and kept by the church. So that diocese might be able to help you. They will might have records of that convent. If you explain the story and explain what you're looking for, they might be able to help you. It's quite recent, so that may, might make things a bit more difficult with privacy concerns, but it's always worth a go. They can only say no, and if you ask enough people, one of them is going to say yes, so keep asking everyone. If there's something relating to family history, ask everyone and you'll get some yeses, definitely. So it's worth a go. Uh, contact that um, diocese and see where you go. And it looks like you've got the information that you need. You've got everything that you would need to find that information. So that will be what I would do, Jane, and that should hopefully help you out. Um, there might be some records in the local archive, but first of all, go to the diocese because they will probably still be keeping the records themselves, especially if it's this recent. If it's earlier, it might be in a council archive, but I doubt it right now. I think it will be the first place. Second place would be the archive. After that, we'll see what goes on. But I think I think that's where to look. So that will be where I'll go. Uh, what have you got? Oh, this is an interesting question from Paul Van Dudson. My head banging on the desk question is where would a person who died in 1802 be buried if they were British and died in the Sudan whilst working for the East India Company? Oh, aha. Now, this is a good question. So if you had a bit of money at this kind of point, often you were taken home. If you go to the local cemetery, or if you look in a town centre or anything like that, you'll find a number of people who were uh, lieutenants or captains or anything that fell in various wars and they were brought home and you'll find their stone or their memorial in the local cemetery. They were brought back. They're often brought back in barrels, often brought back in rum and whiskey just to keep them preserved and for the journey. Sometimes, like people like Stanley Livingston, uh, their body was taken home and their heart was buried where they fell. There's all these different things that come in these different traditions and rules and ideas. But if your family didn't have money, you were basically, if you were a sailor, you died at sea, you were thrown overboard. If you're a captain, you were taken back and you were given a proper burial. It's same with you're a soldier. If you were just a common person, you would probably be buried somewhere there probably with a little memorial and that would be it. If you had a bit more money, which it looks like because you posted a, an oil painting, so I'm guessing it has some money, you'll probably have been brought back home and you would put in a family crypt or family lair, family um, grave. And so that would be where I'd be looking. I'd be looking at local cemeteries from the area and the parish that that family is from in the hope that that person had come back. And so that would be the first thing I would do. And I think that would probably be where they will be. So that's one place to start looking so look for the burials of the rest of the family and usually hopefully they'll be in some family grave and you'll find them together so put him to one side a uh, very dashing chap he is if you look at the question answer you'll see a portrait of him and look for the rest of the family and hopefully he'll be in there somewhere or sometimes you'll get a memorial to them on the stone which will tell you where they're buried as well so that could happen there's often uh, the Scottish memorial inscriptions that we did recently um, there were lots of people who died in places like Africa or India, and it would say uh, died in India, buried there or something like that. So it will give you a bit more, but there would still be memorial to them on the family grave. But maybe it was too expensive to bring them back or anything like that. So that will be the way to get through that one, I think. Um, so let's see, we've got more questions. Uh, Jean has said, how will I find out where my dad served before he was discharged in December 1947? Everything after... Uh, 1920 is still with the Ministry of Defence, uh, no matter how late it goes. My own grandfather's service record, I'm still waiting to get. It's his 91st birthday today, and uh, I'm looking forward to, to raising a, a glass and a, a dram with him this evening. But um, his records as well, um, he was serving in the early 1950s and he um, and 1940s. He His records still... Ministry of Defence, everything, Ministry of Defence. After 1920, that's where to go. So I think if you look through the comments, there's some application uh, guide things and places to look at. Um, go and apply for that service record and 
you'll be able to get that information and that will give you everything about where he served, when he was discharged, lots more information. Uh, it seems like that is the question of the week, getting hold of those service records. Perhaps we need to talk to someone from the Ministry of Defence, maybe see if they can come on and talk with us and talk a bit more about the process of what's in there and what's there, because that would be very interesting. I wonder, I think I know a few a few people that might be interesting to bring on. That's uh, very interesting. I'll, I'll follow that up and I'm sure Ellie will be interested too. So we'll see what we can do about that. Uh, so we've got here. So, oh, see Anya's partner's birthday today. So uh, I see uh, they share a great birthday with my own uh, grandfather. So I'm very happy with that. And uh, I see, uh, thank you, Paul, for chipping in and saying hello. I'm glad, I'm glad you found that answer uh, useful. And uh, let me let us know if you get success, because that's quite good as well. It's nice to know that these tips are getting useful. Um, and uh, Audrey has said, uh, if we can't resolve a missing census, can we send it on to you? Well, you be careful what you wish for, Audrey. But yes, we'll definitely take, see what we can. If Usually, we're quite good at tracking down missing censuses if they exist, but we'll definitely... Um, see what we can do uh, and if there's a missing gap definitely contact support and uh, we'll do our best to track it down and uh, we've got some other uh, questions coming through as well lots and lots um, uh, Lynn a good comment here she's had excellent results finding ancestors in Catholic orders by researching the particular order for sisters right call or visit the mother house if it still exists to find out what records might be available that's interesting too true the order itself might have their own records. That's something and that's worth pursuing. So uh, definitely that's another avenue, uh, Jane, if you're listening to get hold of those records from that nunnery. Uh, what have we got here? Um, ooh, that's an interesting question from Alan Morton Smith. Um, my great grandfather and grandmother were both registrars of births and deaths in Barnet. Hmm. So they may have uh, come into contact with a lot of our own ancestors. That's so interesting. In the early 1900s, would there be any employment records for registrars? Well, um, when we're looking for any kind of employment, I would say in this period particularly, um, it's quite interesting to look at postal directories, trade directories, things like that, because you'll see where someone lives and you'll see what jobs they do. Uh, that's an interesting one. You've got censuses to find out a bit more. Um, in terms of employment, uh, government employments, there are records of uh, civil servants, um, royal and imperial calendars. There's all kinds of things that cover those people who work in, in civil service. So I would start with those as well. And I think we've got some of those on Far My Past. I can't remember which years they cover, but um, definitely that would be where I would start. Uh, and I think there are more of those coming as well. They are great resources. I think they refer to it as the blue book. So take a look for blue books and almost like a yellow pages, but for civil servants and, and uh, those members of, uh, of court. So that would be a great place to look. So you will possibly find some more information in some directories and it might give you some more detail about their civil service career. But that's interesting that you're kind of touching on everyone else's family at the same time. So it's a wonderful little thing to pursue. So that's really, really interesting. And uh, Karen's asked, are actual World War I records to look at all at the National Archives? It would depend. World War I records are scattered in so many different places, depending on who created the records. The Commonwealth War Graves Commission have records of the graves they made, the effects of soldiers, all kinds of different things there. The National Archives has unit war diaries. They have some records that we've digitized and scanned and put online. There's things like service records of people who served in World War I, medal cards. There's lots of different things in lots of different places. If you're looking for people from Australia, New Zealand, some of those records are in uh, National Archives of Australia. And there's things all over the world. Absolutely, it depends where you're looking, what's going on. There are lots of regimental museums that have information, details. We've got a big collection of things like enlistment books and um, service records from things like the Scots Guards, the Tank Corps, the Royal Artillery. And these have come from the local barracks and units and regiments themselves. So there's lots and lots of different ways to get records and you should really look at all of them. If you're looking for some record, chase it all down. And then of course, we can call them World War One records. They're not really that much World War One records, but they are one of the best places to look at for World War One information, newspapers. You'll find lots of details about people in those newspapers who have served in World War One. One of my greatest finds ever is finding a photograph of my great grandfather in his World War One military uniform in a local newspaper. I've got that not because he died, because you know you will get those lists of those who fell and their photographs, but just because he was gassed and he came home on sick leave. So that photograph, again, I didn't own. I didn't know. I'd never seen him in his uniform, and I had that with some information about him 
newspapers were the best place to look in that sort of period, 1914 to about 1919, because they keep going a bit longer. You can look for photographs, you can look for details, look for names. Be prepared to experiment a bit with the names that you use. So if you're, for example, Daniel Cleland is what I was looking for, don't just look for Daniel Cleland. You might find him as that. Look for D. Cleland. Look for Cleland and look for the rank, maybe Private Cleland. Look for the service number. Look for different things to get yourself in. All of those things might give you a way to get the records that you need, and that's the best way to do And the same with all newspaper research. Don't be wedded to that full name because you might find them as Mrs. Perkins instead of Jane Perkins or something like that. And this is where you might be coming unstuck when you're looking for records. So broaden it out and try these different things. It's like a combination lock. Keep turning the key until you get exactly the right thing to stick in there, and then that will help you a lot. So we see what we've got. I see uh, um, Ches saying, are there any known Dragoon Guards records in the end of 1800s having issues finding anything and they don't reply to emails? We got a great collection of service records that go all the way back to 1760 on Find My Past. So those will be where I would look. And I know they have dragoons in there. I know the Scots Greys are in there because I've got one of my own ancestors was uh, in the Scots Greys and was there in the early 1800s. So there are lots of records there to look at. And I would start there. That will be the place. There are some great army lists as well that exist and some wonderful ones already on Find My Past. Maybe some more upcoming. Who knows? watch this space but definitely uh, there are some great records that exist now and more on the way so uh, that would be where i would start our military uh, records our service records british army service records 1760 to 1920 i believe it is and that's on our all record sets or just do a broad search on our records and filter by military and hopefully you'll get those records chose so that would help you and uh, i see there uh, some more records um, Nikki has said, my dad was a Bevin boy. I'm aware of their website. He's listed on there on the deceased list. I don't know how to find out where the mine was that he worked at. That would be some employment records that you need to look for. And that's slightly harder depending on the mine. Um, start with the local archive and see if they have any mining records. Some do, some don't. A little bit harder, that one. Um, again, possibly censuses. If you're looking at the right kind of time, the 1921 census coming soon, um, will give you a little bit more detail about where people worked. So that'll be really useful when that comes, if we're looking at that kind of time. So it just depends a little bit on if they've been working all the way through or if they just came in as a Bevin boy. So there's, there's other ways to think about this, but um, they start with the local archive and go from there. Never underestimate a local archive catalogue because that will um, really hopefully have lots of records that are um, digitised, all that kind of stuff. Um, if you're looking as well, um, the 1939 register might have some details in that extra column. Um, I believe the Bevan boys are a bit later than that, the, but there might be some detail again if he was a miner for longer. It depends just exactly how long this person was mining for. So look at all of these different places and hopefully they will be able to help you. And um, yes, Andrew's made a really good point. Service numbers are best because searching by initial could pull up anybody. If you get a service number and you know that service number is there and that you think that might be one, search with the service number. You'll usually get 20 or 30 results. People with that service number, they weren't unique until a bit later on, but you're probably okay with knowing which one is yours because of the fact that there won't be too many with the same name, usually none. And so those then we can look at those records and go, huh, okay. And that I find is great. When I have, say, three or four medal cards, and I don't know which medal card is my ancestors, I take the service numbers down and I search for each. And hopefully I can find a bit more about what happened to each of those people and I can do a bit of negative research. I can cross them off as it goes through. So that is what I keep doing when I use service numbers. Don't be afraid of using a part of and a bit of history, a part of a record to get to what you need to do. So ignore names sometimes. And I know it feels weird and it feels a bit uncomfortable and, and counterintuitive, but sometimes you've got to put the names away. And we're genealogists. We're obsessed with names and dates. Maybe you just need a date. Maybe you just need a place. Maybe you just need an occupation. Maybe you just need a service number. That will get you there and start narrowing down by adding in more bits of information. That will be how you can get a little bit further. I see there. Um, I see uh, lots and lots of information here. We see, see um, saying I'm behaving. Wednesdays are a special place and a special time where we talk about family history and we get you further, which is what matters. I've been very professional. Uh, Fridays is when we go off the rails, as we should, as Fridays is the way. So I look forward to Friday where I'm sure there'll be all kinds of things. But until then, 
uh, we're, we're all business. Uh, <laughs> because what can be more important than finding answers? As Karen said, when searching records, should we input the parish or the townland or diocese for Catholic records? A bit unsure about this. It would be the parish. So if you've got a townland inside the parish, then look for that parish. You might find the townland listed as a residence or something like that. So that would be what I would be doing. But again, if you don't find the answer, try the other one. Try perhaps some records might be stored by townland because whenever something's supposed to apply to a rule, you can guarantee your ancestors probably did something different. And so just be aware and have it in the back pocket to try the next thing. So you're already quite ahead because you're thinking of the two and you're going, ah, what should I do? So really good thinking. Start with the parish though, because records usually stored by parish, that parish church, the local satellite churches would submit their records to the parish, you'd have it there, and that would be where I would look for. So that would be the place to go. Um, and uh, Linda's saying, I'll probably make up for it on Friday. Oh, well, we'll see, won't we? <laughs> you have to tune in on Friday to find out. Um, Andrew has asked, we'll be digitizing absent voters lists. If you have a service number, you can find an address from where they were living. We do have a collection of some absent voters lists. The great thing about those is we put them in two places. Not only are they in a collection of military records, they're also in our normal uh, electoral rolls as well. Um, there will be more absent voters list in the future, and there are some already. So definitely, Andrew, they're on the radar, and uh, the ones that are there are useful too. So uh, really good spot there, and we'll be doing lots more. Okay, so uh, let's find out what we've got. We've got some more questions going on. Um, ah, Linda's saying, I'd love to get my granddad's military records, but he was illegitimate. I don't know his date of birth. Date of birth is one of the requirements on the application form. I know his regiment. Uh, and they signed up at age 16 and served for 22 years. I've uh, already been in touch with Worcester, the Worc Worcestershire Regiment. Sorry, it's getting later. And they've told me what they know. Do you think there's any point applying with no date of birth? I mean, always a point. As we said earlier, uh, the worst thing they can do is say no. Um, try it without. Perhaps it's enough. If it's not, then you haven't lost anything. So, you know, it's worth a go. If this is the record that you need to find out more information, uh, never... Never accept no for an answer and just keep going and keep trying because, you know, who knows? Um, you know, you're asked for a lot of information. And uh, then, of course, you know, if you haven't got all of it, you haven't got all of it. Not everyone will have all the records, but that's okay. Try with what you got. And said so if they say no, then at least you tried. If you didn't try at all, you've got no chance. If you try without, you've got a little chance. So it's worth a go. So I would say always do that. Uh, what have you got here? So uh, a good question from, uh, here we go. Are there any employee records from Duke Mills in Dundee? Yes, there are. There are some. Um, there are some Duke Mill records in the Dundee archives. I know that, I think. And uh, some of those are online. I think Dundee archives have their own site as well with some records on. And there are some great records in our newspapers that talk about the Duke Mills in Dundee. Lots from our wonderful parent company, DC Thompson, a great newspaper publisher in Dundee, had lots of records that talk about uh, Duke Mills and people that work there and any stories and lots of other details as well. There are some even, I think, in Dundee Library, if I remember rightly. And one of the great things when we launched our Scottish records uh, recently, our wonderful big Scottish parish records collection, we had the, the the eminence that is Brian Cox, the actor who you might see at the moment in succession. He's all over the television at the moment uh, in support of that and his biography, which has just been released, his autobiography. Fascinating read, really worth taking a look at. And he is from Dundee and he's got roots here. And he was explaining how Dundee was very different from a lot of the rest of the country because of the fact that women were wanted in the Duke Mills for their nimble hands and fingers. And so it was men that were staying at home and raising the children. And they called them kettle bilers. And it was a slightly different way of doing it because the men often were former farmers or people who traveled to Dundee with urbanization and started this new life in this new, new place, this new town. Their wives got jobs, their wives were paying for them, and they had nothing to do. And so it was a perfect storm of uh, social deprivation and issues because these people would usually turn to drink. They would be you know, depressed, there'd be mental health issues, all kinds of things. And it would cause this terrible uh, family situation and a ruckus. And it could be a uh, very, very, um, a very, very horrible situation, and particularly in these um, not great places to live either. So um, there's lots of information about different things that may have happened. There are some court uh, and criminal records and things from around there that we also have uh, lots of records from those people when these things happen. 
but fascinating to get a bit of that social context and local history as well when we look at Dundee and the Duke Mills and the discovery um, uh, is one of the places that people go to. They take a look at and they see the ship and they enjoy that. But the, the Duke Mill Museum, I can't remember the name of it, but the, the museum there is really, really interesting. And the last time I went, there was a lady there who was one of the original uh, workers there long before it became a museum when she started when she was very, very young. And uh, she's still showing people around and, and showing people how it all works, how it's made. So if you've got any Duke Mill relatives, even if they're not from Dundee, to see all the factory apparatus, the machinery, how it works, and have it all explained is worth going just to get that context. And there we go. Uh, Sylvia's made another point. Dundee University Archives has some Duke Mill records, lots and lots of things there to find. Um, so we've got the Verdant Works. There we go. That's what we're looking for, the Verdant Works. Really recommend it. There's a mining museum as well. There's a few different things um, that are worth looking at around the country to give you that bit of history around how your ancestors worked, lived, played. They're all really fascinating because once you learn a bit more about that context, it might clue you in to where to look. And it also gives you that appreciation for the fact that our ancestors lived through some pretty tough times. And when they did, they got through it. And they got through it and we're the result. And it's amazing to think that you are the sum and promulgation of your ancestors. Millions of years of your ancestors all coming together and you are the, the final product. All of the, the, the people who were heroes, villains, uh, the lowest, the landed, kings, queens, sheep thieves, all of these people come together and make you, you. That's that phrase who do you think you are is such a, a big thing because that is it it's what we are uh, there's one thing i think i see glenn saying he's watching from italy and i have to say now when we're talking about italy uh, if you all saw who do you think you are last night I, I, I tried really hard not to say it but i'm gonna have to um there might you might have spotted a little error uh, which uh, i was shouting at the tv over um there's a wonderful italian church in clerkenwell which I, I studied a little bit when i did uh, when i did my master's degree in family history uh, one of my theses was on the italian community of of britain uh from the 1800s all the way to the 1900s and seeing them establish themselves but um that church uh, which is a catholic church just around the corner from our office to find my past and uh pixie lots was there looking at her ancestors and she was looking at a a wonderful baptismal record. You're seeing this, and I believe it's on Far My Past. So it's a, a great connection to our records. We've got Catholic records from London. And the expert showed her this record. And what happened? What went wrong? Has anyone got any any solution? I'm, I'm going to leave it open and see if anyone can tell me what, what was wrong, what the mistake was that was made. Because it, it made me really bite my hand. Uh, I tried, and every single uh, fiery Italian blood cell in me uh, shouted to the heavens, and the hand gestures alone were, it was worse than the uh, the European Cup, I tell you. It was one of those things. I see, I don't see any comments just yet. I was hoping to end on this, and no one yet has said. So what have we got? Anyone can think of it, or shall I give you the answer? Oh, is there anything? I can't see yet. Oh, well, I can't see. So I'm going to I'm gonna give you it, and uh, if anyone answers while I'm explaining, then you, you get the point. But, ah, there we go. Sarah's got it. So uh, and, and so is stamping and stitching. So is Karen. They've all come around. Sylvia as well. Oh, uh, Victoria. Lots and lots of people there spotting it out. You're all good genealogists. Fantastic. And it shows that even experts can make mistakes. The record was not uh, Italianized because they're an Italian church. It was written in Latin. All Catholic registers are written in Latin until the 1960s. All of our Catholic records, you'll see lots and lots of our Catholic records from our uh, uh, diocese and archdiocese all over the country and all over the world even those people will have their names written in latin you'll find henricus for henry you'll find guliamus for william all of this stuff and the great thing on farmer past is that we have matched the two together so if you're looking for william we'll give you guliamus if you're looking for all this stuff we'll give you if you're looking for john we'll give you johannes and that means that you cannot know the latin name and you'll still get that answer you'll still get the result to look at so that's the thing to look for. But those records were Latin. They weren't Italian. And uh, so it's very different. Latin searching, uh, again, on Farmer Pass, you can do it. And you can do it with those original names. But everything in a Catholic church is Latin. It's not in Italian. And so that is the thing. That is the one. So Linda's saying she shouted at the telly at that point. It, I wonder if you could have heard me from Edinburgh. I was very loud. I was uh, told off for shouting so loudly. But uh, yes, so this is a good point. 
uh, hopefully all of these tips and questions and things that uh, hopefully spurring you on a little bit further are of help. But even experts sometimes make mistakes. And the best thing to do with any of these bits of advice or anything else is to make sure that you do as much research as possible, that you cross the T's and dot the I's. You research and find context, find bits of history, and um, then you can really, really pull things together and make sure that you're right. Confirm everything. If you find a family tree, even if you find my family tree, which I know a lot of you seem to be related to me, and you probably will find it when you match into it, um, check it. Don't take it as fact. Go and take that information and take it as a hint and then go and find the evidence and hope that it's well sourced enough, which I hope it is, if you are looking at my family tree, um, to show you where the evidence came from. Then look at the evidence and don't just take that evidence. Make the same searches because I might have picked one of these records and there might be three records there. And you don't know why I've picked that one. Maybe I've picked it because I just couldn't be bothered looking at the other ones. Maybe, you know, I wasn't good enough. Maybe it was just the only one I found and you found more. There are other ways to be sure to confirm things. Always make sure that you are belt and braces. You're doing all of this because that is when you know you're doing your family tree and not someone else's. If you want to do my family tree, that would be lovely. But also... It's better to do your own because that's what matters. We talked about who your ancestors were and how important they are. They are important. They're yours. And that's what matters. And that is why family history is so exciting when we find a new thing about our ancestor. So don't do someone else's. Um, and that, I think, is a way to round things off as we have gone to the top of the hour, a little bit over. Um, thank you very much for joining me for this. I hope these questions and answers are helpful. So we'll be doing this every single month. So there'll be many more to come. And if you do have questions, store them up. If you didn't get your question answered this time, don't worry. Maybe next time. We've had a lot coming through. And then, of course, if you have anything uh, that you think of on the spur of the moment next month, come and join us again, and we'll still answer that. You'll see me again on Friday, where we'll be a little bit more laid back and a little bit more fun as we talk about the record releases of the week and talk about all our family history finds and the fun things we do. If you do find new things, then let us know on Friday. It's always really exciting to know that this has been helpful. And if you do find it helpful, let us know. Tell everyone, tell your friends, uh, tell your family. It's great fun. And, of course, tomorrow there's that very special uh, remembrance uh, presentation at the same time, which has Alex Cox and some really, really incredibly knowledgeable guests. So that'd be worth tuning in. I know a lot of you have had First World War questions, questions about service records. They are the experts. They're the ones to ask as well. So uh, definitely go back and try and find more and uh, go to them with any questions. Have a think, write it down and see if you can get that question in tomorrow as well. Uh, we love bringing in all these experts that know all this great information. Uh, it's great to give you as much of a grasp of family history as we can from as many different places. I always learn new things too. I can't wait to watch that one. And so that's going to be great fun. Uh, military records, again, free uh, from 10 o'clock tomorrow uh, all the way till the 15th in honor of remembrance. So if you want to use some of those military records we talked about, then go and search for those if you haven't got a subscription. If you haven't got a subscription, then of course, I'm sure you will soon because there are so many great records. Maybe this week is your day with the new records arriving, but also there's definitely many, many more records to come and there'll be many more sessions like this to come too. So thank you very much. And uh, I won't uh, say in uh, Italianized <laughs> Latin or anything, um, but uh, yeah, I, maybe I will. Um, so, uh, you know, carpe diem. <laughs> See you later, and I'll see you on Friday. Take care. Bye-bye.